Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359, 0703-768118. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. God, as we again look at the matter of being a suitable helper, Lord, we know this is one of the things you want us to surrender. We pray, oh God, that your, your spirit will be here to teach us. You will open our eyes of understanding so that even in this matter, we will not take your throne from you. In the name of Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh Lord, that your will will prevail over our hearts this morning. Thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yesterday we started looking at arising as a suitable helper. And we discovered that the word help actually means to assist it means to be useful to somebody and it means to make it easier for someone to do something and we saw that right from the beginning actually what God made us and what he called us is a helper that's our name it was the man that called his wife woman. But from the heart of God, what he called her is, I will make him a help. So the woman is a help. And we discovered that that's how the manufacturer designed us. And for us to try to be another thing. For us to say, no, how can I be subordinate to somebody? How can I be a help? Why can't I be the head? You don't have that grace as far as the home is concerned. You don't have it. In the home, there is order. The husband is the head, the wife is the helper. And we saw that we needed to follow that, uh, that order if all will be well with us. We saw that if God is saying, go and help somebody, that you are a helper to someone, we saw that that means there is a work to be done. There is a work to be done. Otherwise, there will be no need for a help. Unfortunately, some of our men have not yet discovered what is the work that they needed to do in the kingdom of God. And we also said that if you, as a single person, marry somebody who is not doing the work of God, who is not busy with the vision, the purpose of God for his life. That sort of, that kind of person will only make you to sit down. You will be idle as far as God is concerned and you will have to be idle with him. So there will be, you know, an extinguishing of whatever fire God has kindled upon your life. Never mind, God could ask your husband, the person you, well, the person you are to marry as a young person, that the call of God on his life is tied with, say, his teaching profession. That that teaching profession is a means of reaching out to young people whose vision they carried. Somebody who has a vision for the youth, for example, and is teaching in a school, you know he's in a good place. He will pastor thousands of students. So that could be a calling. When I talk about being busy with the you know, purpose of God, doing the work of the kingdom, I'm not talking about going into full-time ministry. I hope you understand that by now. It could be a calling for you to go and labor in a school over young people. 
So that work is just a means to an end. A means of fulfilling your call. But if you get there and you change. And you now start looking for money. And you are afraid to pursue the ministry in that school. You know you have already failed. So when I talk about somebody knowing the call of God on his life. Is diversified. And you must know that. But one thing you must be sure about is that this one knows what he's doing. He knows what is the purpose of God for his life. If he has not known it, as a young lady, and you have prayed, and you are sure this is the person God wants you to marry, pray again that he should know it. And if by the time it is getting to the time to marry, and he has not known it, pray again and discuss it. Otherwise, I'm sorry, the first few years of your life may be wasted. This is the truth. Sometimes we rush to enter into an engagement, courtship with somebody without really ascertaining these things. And you think, yes, I want to marry. It is God. It is God that is wanting me to marry him. But really, it may not be God after all. You don't know. So pray again. Except God is really saying, go ahead. I will help you. You don't have to rush into it. But if God says, go inside, fine. Who am I to say don't go inside? One crucial thing that you must ensure ever before getting engaged to somebody is that the person is born again. That one is very crucial. That one is the bedrock. So if he is born again and it is not yet clear the kind of thing that God wants him to do and you know he is also interested, you can pursue it together. But if he is somebody who is just churchy, you know churchy people, just religious, and you say, oh, he loves the Lord. I want to marry him. He will serve the Lord. I'm sorry. He may be an unbeliever in church uniform. And before you know it, he, he, he has brought out the real him. So don't marry an unbeliever. You know, of course, that God told us, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And who is an unbeliever? An unbeliever is someone who is still living in sin. That's the definition. Don't say an unbeliever is somebody who doesn't go to church. No. There are many unbelievers who go to church. But the demarcation between the children of God and the children of the devil is in 1 John chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. Sin is the one that puts the demarcation. When you see a young man is still living in sin, he has proposed to you, you have agreed with him, and every time he's pestering your life to kiss you, to romance you, to sleep with you, and he says, if you really love me, how will you show you that you really love me? Prove it to me that you really love me, and the proof he's looking for is kisses, romances, and to sleep with him. That person is a thief, he's a robber. He wants to rob you of your dignity. Run! 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 Run with your physical legs. Run! The Bible says flee fornication. So you know what I mean. Fly and run at the same time. Don't press on with such a fellow. He says if you marry such a fellow, Joshua chapter 13 verse 23 or so, he says it will be a thorn in your eyes. And weep for your back until you perish from the land which the Lord God is giving you. So don't marry an unbeliever. Don't marry someone who is still living in sin. Don't. May God help us in Jesus' name. Now we also said that because there is a work to be done. As a helper, you need to find out that work yourself. Don't just say, eh, well, he will tell me what he wants me to do. He may not tell you. He may know it. He may not have utterance. Do you know somebody may know something, but you don't know how to express it. So, it is the one who posted you there that should give you the job description. Am I right? It is the person who posted you to that place. I should give you what you should do. And that's the Lord. So go to God. Pray. 
Speak to the Lord about it and he will reveal it to you. It becomes easier <clears throat> to enter into God's purpose when God reveals what you are to do in that house. It becomes easy. You don't waste time. As soon as you get married, you just discover that both of you, you have plunged into it. You don't face each other to start quarreling. You know that there is a busy work ahead of you. You don't have time for quarreling. You will face the work of God together and you just see that Satan has no space in your midst. The devil only finds work. For who? An idle hand. Now we are going to go ahead again looking at the, what it now implies to be a helper. You will discover that when the Bible calls us a helper, it also implies that we, we will have enough strength to be able to bear part of the burdens that the man is carrying. A helper needs to be strong. A helper needs to have enough strength commensurate with the job to be done. If I needed to carry this pulpit, for example, and I call a two-year-old child to come and help me carry this pulpit. What do you think will happen? <clears throat> eh? I will have to carry the child and carry the pulpit. Because that child has no strength to help me carry the pulpit. In fact, the child will be crying, Mommy, carry me. Mommy, carry me. Help me to carry this pulpit. Carry me. Mommy, carry me back, back. Put me on your back. You know, that's what the child will be saying. Because he's a child. He doesn't have the strength to carry the pulpit. Not only that, he also needs help. Now, when God says you are a helper, you must be strong in your inner man. Enough to be able to assist that man. You must be strong in your inner man to be able to carry part of the burdens that God wants him to carry. A helper is not a, is not a weak person at all. It's not a weakling. Do you remember one helper in the Bible? With whom the Bible says, and when the helper comes... Who is that? The Holy Spirit. Is he a weakling? Ah. In fact, some helpers, some helpers, sometimes are stronger than the people they are helping. I'm not saying you are stronger than your husband. Though. But I'm telling you, the issue of help expands to a great extent. That you have strength to help this man. So to be a helper, at least, even if you don't have strength more than him, you will have strength to be able to help him. You will not be a weakling. So when you have a woman whom God says is a helper and he's a weakling, that man is in trouble. He has double load to carry. When the man is struggling with issues and Oh, I want to serve God. I want us to do this. Look, God seems to be saying uh, all our salary for the next five months. He wants us to plunge it into the work of God. And we should just be praying. He will meet our needs. The woman will say, eh? What are you talking? Which salary? Okay, give your own. Leave my own alone. Leave my own alone. I'm not going with you into that one. How can you, how, how are we going to be sustained? What about the children? No way. Do you know such a fellow is a child? It's a baby. His husband carry me. Husband carry me. When the husband is saying, I need help, he says, No, carry me rather. No, you are not a helper if you are doing such a thing. When he carries a body, you assist him. Ah, those of us who have believers as our husbands, you don't know what you are missing. 
that you are still giving him tough time. The man is saying, God wants us to pursue this matter of full-time ministry. He is on full-time and he is missing the, the contribution of his wife. And he's saying, won't you, darling, drop this job. God will meet our needs. You say, what? How dare you think about that? Is it not my salary that we are eating? Is it not my salary that all the children are using to go to school? Don't talk that to me. If God is speaking to you, he's not speaking to me. Do you know many of us, that's our attitude. You are not a helper. You are a child. You are a body. You won't, you won't make him progress. You are a fire extinguisher. That man won't go far. As a helper, you must be strong also in your inner man. You must not be a weakling. You must be a woman of faith who is able to bear burdens and faithfully follow your husband. Knowing that the Lord who called you is faithful. So a helper is not a weakling. A helper is not a baby. A helper must not be a baby Christian. Husband, carry me Christian. If you know that you can't meet our needs, why did you marry me? Why did you marry me? The Bible says anyone who does not provide for his family is worse than an infidel. If you know you can't marry and provide for your family, why did you marry me? That one is husband, carry me. You must be strong. And so, for us to be able to help our husbands, we need to develop our roots in the Lord. Develop your roots. Don't be a tomato Christian. Don't be a maize Christian. You know tomato and maize. How many days does it take for tomato to, to grow? Just maybe five, six days. And then, by the time it grows, it dies with the first fruit. The same thing with maize. And how long do you need cutlass to uproot tomato? Just your two fingers, you pull it like this, it's gone. Tomatoes are weaklings. Don't be a tomato Christian. What God says about his children in Isaiah chapter 61 is that we shall be trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. Perennial trees. Trees, deep roots. That even if the devil comes to shake that tree, it will still be standing. Are you getting what I'm saying? As a helper, you don't need to be a tomato Christian. You don't need to be a weekly. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 says, Develop your roots. Be rooted in him. And grow up in him in, in all things. Be rooted. Be rooted in Christ. In your own personal life. So that you can be strong enough to help the man that God wants you to help. God normally gives a measure of grace to a woman depending on the need in her husband's life and calling. Every woman has grace. Every woman. That's why the Bible says anyone who finds a wife finds what? A good thing. And has obtained what? Favor from the Lord. Grace from the Lord. A woman is like an embodiment of God's grace. Able to do anything. So there is grace to help the type of husband that you have married. There is grace. There is grace. Your husband is different from mine. But the kind of grace God gives me for my husband, you can't go near it. And your own husband, the grace to help that man is in your life. I can't go near that. So each one of us, God has particularly endowed us with grace for our men. If you have not discovered it, go and find out from the Lord. Go and receive grace for your own particular husband. You will discover that to help him is not difficult after all. So, God gives grace. And as you fulfill your role as a helper, which God called you to be, you know that actually you are fulfilling your primary calling. Don't, 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 uh, you know, don't aspire to be the head. I kept saying it. Don't aspire to be the leader in the home. You are not the head. God has not made you so. 
be what God wants you to be. And as you are doing that, as you are doing the work of a helper, you will also discover that you are getting fulfilled. Because you are fulfilling a calling in your family. The calling to help your husband. Just as somebody who is a personal assistant in an office or a personal secretary. Do you know that if that fellow stands very well and works hard as a personal assistant, the person she is assisting will do a good job. Am I right? Just face your own duty as a personal assistant to your husband. Don't aspire to be the MD, which you are not. In your place of work, you can be the MDO. I'm talking about your home. Don't be what God does not want you to be. Be what God has made you. And as you are doing that, your own calling, you are fulfilling it. And God is going to reward you in the name of Jesus Christ. Again, the work of being a helper is for us to also help our husbands to get rid of his aloneness. Do you know that in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 that we read before, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be what? Alone. So one of the, one of the things that God wants us to accomplish in our homes is to help our husbands to get rid of his aloneness. Do you know many men are naturally, naturally alone? They are naturally thinking they are complete. So they think alone. They plan alone. They execute projects alone. They only come to give you information. That's the condition we find in many homes. They are naturally alone. They are alone people. That's their mentality. But God is posting you there to help him to get rid of that aloneness. So that his life, which is a fraction, can be complete. Help him to get rid of that aloneness. Some people are married, but they are still alone. Am I right? They are married, but they are still alone in everything. They only issue commands. And they say, do your own, I'll do my own. I have met a man, a husband, a man of God, for that matter, who married a born-again Christian sister. And this sister, even before she got married also, she's been serving the Lord. And then she married this pastor. And each time the, the sister, you know, wants to press, you know, to help in the church, help children, help the women, you know, the man will say, no, no, this is not your own ministry. If you want your ministry, go to God and get your own. This is my own ministry. So he will be there on the pulpit preaching to the congregation. He will go to the women fellowship and preach to them. He will preach to the children. He, he, he will cancel and cancel and cancel. He was doing everything alone. The sister said, ah, ah, but I'm your wife. That's why I'm here. Eh? We are together. I'm also interested. I want to serve God. Go and get your own ministry. You know, that man doesn't know what he is doing. He has changed now. He has changed. God has helped him. But in those days, it was tough. And it happened for many years. And that church never grew. They remained small for years. Men are naturally alone. They don't want you to, you know, to come in. But you can help them. When you discover that that's the kind of man that you have married, then you need to go to God. And say, Father, you posted me to this man. But he seems to be perfect in himself. He doesn't need any help. He doesn't need any help. But yet, you have posted me there because you see that he needs a help. Lord, open his understanding. Lord, open, open that gap in his life and let him see it. Do you know the Bible said when God took away that rib, what did he do? 
he covered it with the flesh. And so many men appear complete. But there is a gap inside. But they don't know they are, they are incomplete. And you that God has posted. And you, you are now knowing that you are posted there to help that man. Plead with God to expose that, that gap. So that he will see his nakedness. And then he will open his arms for you to fit in. Do you understand what I'm saying? Help him to get rid of his aloneness. So that you will be able to contribute your God-given help to him. And your lives will be thoroughly complete. The Bible says two are better than one. For they have a good reward for their labor. When somebody is working alone, there is no good reward for your labor. The Bible says one shall chase how many? One thousand. But two, how many? Ten thousand to flight. You will put ten thousand to flight. You have a good reward for your labor. So when you see a man who, who seems not to need help, you really need to pray. That's part of the help to contribute. Help him until he is able to get rid of his aloneness and he allows you to fit into his life. In the same way, some women are also alone. Some women, they like to be alone. They are married, but they are alone. Alone in their thinking. Alone facing their difficulties. Alone, they are alone planning. Some are building houses their husband don't know. Some of them have fat, fat, fat bank accounts. The man doesn't know. You see, if he knows, my husband is very extravagant. He will blow it. Some are doing things alone and the man doesn't know it. You will also pray for your life and say, Lord, I am married but I'm alone. I'm doing things alone. Lord, break that aloneness from my life so that I may blend with my husband. What you, the excuses you are giving may be correct. But then, God has another way around it. If you pray, there will be wisdom. If you have married an extravagant husband, God can change him. He is the maker. You can make him. It is not by your doing things alone that you will change him. Allow the maker to be at work. So, help him. Blend together. Help him to overcome his aloneness while you also overcome yours. So that you can fulfill the will of God for your life. Part of the aloneness that we, we create in our families is that some of us, we separate. We are, we are still married you know, together. We are still married. But we separate from our husbands because we are looking for money. Eh? Nowadays, you see the man working in uh, Lagos and the woman is working in Abuja. And they marry by correspondence. Eh? Married by correspondence. The man is alone. The woman is alone. Just for, for the sake of mammon. When God says what God has joined together, let nothing separate. Mammon has separated many homes. Career has separated many homes. And people are going alone. They are doing things alone. They are facing life alone. And for years that may happen. Just to look for money. Look, if, when you are ready to do the will of God, Nothing must stand before you. I remember when I wanted to take up a job in Benway State. When I moved there, after we got married, I applied to the state government to get, you know, a job in the hospital. And I went and went and went. And this, this fellow who was the, the chief medical officer, the state chief medical officer then. She also, being a Christian, she told me, we can't post you to where your husband is staying. And there was only one doctor in the hospital in that town. They needed a doctor. But she said, no, I'm not going to post you there. You will go to Dekina. Those of you that know Benway and Kogi State, that's how many, many, many kilometers, hundreds of kilometers away. He said, I should go to Dekina from Casina Allah. Ah, ah. I said, but you know, I'm newly married. 
just with one child. How will I go far away like that from my husband? She closed the chapter. So I said, well, not because of money will I separate from my husband. I prefer to stay at home. If it's Gary, I will be drinking. No problem. If they say a doctor is just drinking Gary in her husband's home, there is no problem. I'm doing the will of God. God will provide. So I stayed. Until after a while, when God now opened another door, and I got another job, not this time in the state hospital, but in a mission hospital, where I worked before I finally resigned. And I resigned. My husband, just to help him, was the major part of my resignation. Because if my job, again, will hinder me from contributing that help to his life, I better resign. Let job go. God will meet our needs. And today, we are here. We can testify that God is good. When you obey God, he will not leave you stranded. Even if it be obeying him in marriage, he won't leave you stranded. He will open the door and things will come and you will never, never be put to shame. So don't let mammon separate you. Don't let mammon elongate the aloneness that God planned to finish by the time he was bringing you into marriage. There are some men of God, just because the money they are getting from the church is not enough, they threw their wife into one job far away. And the woman is there, working, working, just to bring money in. And then, some other people, in the church, they are harvesting your husband behind you. Why will you lose your home? Just because of mammon. Mammon has power, you know. But, thank God, God has broken that power. That idol will no longer survive in any of our lives. In the name of Jesus. So, help him to get rid of his aloneness. Help him. Don't separate because of money. Don't separate because of job. Don't allow anything to put you asunder. It is better to be glued to him than to separate. It is only then that you will have a good reward for your labor. May God give you understanding in the name of Jesus. If it happens that transfer transfers you somewhere beyond where your husband is, if God helps you, and you, you stay there for one year. You are pursuing your movement back. And they don't want to transfer you back. There is nothing wrong in resigning. I dare to say that to you boldly. In order to maintain family sanity. Do you know our children are suffering because of this pursuit of mammon? When you separate, children are disoriented. So they don't, you know, many children grew only under their mother. Some grew only under their father. And in a bid to do that, we have seen many children, because the two hands that should watch over them are not there. Either uh, house girls are training them in sexual immorality, or some other kinds of people are dealing with them, because the two eyes are not there. Don't allow anything to separate you. Your children will become vagabonds. I pray God to give you understanding. What I'm saying is not legalistic. I'm not giving you rules and regulations. As the Holy Spirit speaks to you, there could be some adjustments. It's not that you must not, you know, go and stay in a different place when the two of you are agreed. I'm not really saying that. What I'm saying is, as much as it lies in your power, don't separate. Do you understand me? Don't separate. Let nothing separate you. Even if the thing is beyond your power, cry to God until he answers you and come back together within a short while so that the devil does not walk behind you. You are to, to get rid of that aloneness in your family. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. About this help that God is talking about. He said, and the Lord God said, 
It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. I want the amplified version to help us again because we want to make progress on that verse. Amplified, yes. Now the Lord God said, yes, it is not good, sufficient, satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, meat, meat, suitable, suitable, adapted, adapted, complementary to him. <laughs> a helper, suitable, meat. Another version says a helper, fit for him. A helper, fit for him. So we, we want to take note of that word, fit. Meat, suitable, adapted, complementary. What does that mean? To be a helper, fit for your husband. You all know, as I know that you have visited a tailor before, that when they want to make a dress for you, what do they do? They measure you in order to make that dress to fit you, to be your size. Am I right? Now, when God was going to make you for your husband, he has measured his life. He has measured what he will become in life. Not what, not what he is today only, but what he will ever become, and God knows it. He has measured the need in his life. And with that measurement, he went ahead to make you. And so, as you get married... He, he, God is saying, you are the one that is fit for your husband. Other girls, other women, they are either oversized or undersized. I want you to take note of this. This is God speaking. He says, you are the help that is his size. You are the help fit for him. And every grace needed to help that man to succeed is inside your life. Now, you don't have to take that for granted. Sometimes we take it for granted. Never mind, even your husband may take it for granted. That's why some husbands leave their wives and they go to hire intercessors to pray for them. Have you seen that before? They get some, some you know, young ladies with thin, thin legs. Eh? Who, who, who call themselves intercessors? Hallelujah. Girls untested. They have never married to know how to, how to be a wife and be a mother and still be an intercessor. They are not married. But, you know, they, they think that, no, you know, we are intercessors. Hallelujah. And your husband is deceived. Because you are pregnant. And as you are rolling here and there with that pregnancy. By the time you pray for 10 minutes. You are tired. And so your husband is saying. Ah, my, my wife is not prayerful. Let me go to these intercessors. You know it could happen. But what I hear God saying is this. That no matter how small the prayer life of a woman is. Her prayer is the only suitable prayer for her husband. Even if those outside intercessors pray for hours for him, they are helping him quite right, but their help is not suitable until their wives contribute her own prayer before that prayer becomes suitable. There are helpers. There are helps that people can get. Fine. People can help us. But the only suitable help. Do you know the meaning of suitable? What does it mean to be suitable? Eh? The one that is the right one. The right one. The, the one that is. It meets its need. That's the right one. So even if it's for five minutes, you labor before God to pray for your husband, God will mark it correct. Some of 
of us, we don't, we don't contribute that prayer help to our husbands. So we allow these thin, thin legged children to snatch away that man. And later you are crying. You say, oh, there are this, this seducing spirit in our church. They are snatching my husband. Where were you? Where were you? Did you contribute that help? And he, 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 he says, it doesn't matter. If you contribute that help, that, uh, that prayer help, do you know by the time his life is bursting forth and grace is issuing out, he wouldn't even think of any outside intercessor again. I'm not saying people should not intercede, young ladies. Be an intercessor. It's good though. Now that you are young, you have all the time. Even married women, God makes us intercessors. But let me tell you, don't use your intercession to break another person's home. If you want to pray for a pastor, pray for him in your closet. Let him not even know. Is that not what the Bible says? When you pray, go into your closet. Don't pray like the hypocrites who pray so that they will be seen. When you are hired as an intercessor, you are praying so that you will be seen. You are praying for money. You are looking for envelopes to collect. All those kinds of works, they are works that will burn to ashes. There is no reward. So don't get involved in that. It's good to pray for our pastors, our women of God, very nice. It's good to pray for them because they are standing there and they may be targets of the devil. Pray for them. But let it be in your closet. Don't make a, a mess of yourself. You know, carrying yourself about and uh, putting placard. Intercessors. Intercessors. What's, what's the meaning of that? May God help us in Jesus' name. So, as women, we are helpers. Sweet table for our husbands. God has made us to be the sweet table ones for them. Our counsel is the suitable counsels for them. Our prayer is the suitable prayer for their lives. Everything inside you is what is suitable for your husband. Don't waste it. Don't hoard it. Don't do it for yourself. You are not existing for yourself. Pray for him. Spend time in the closet. Take care of him. You are his helper, sweet table. Don't, don't waste that grace of God. Because if he doesn't find help in you, he is going to look for help somewhere else, even if he doesn't profit him. Be the help that you are meant to be. Because God has measured him in order to make you contribute that grace into his life. We are helpers. And do you know that actually what is what God took away from him that made him to become a man who needs help? Eh? What God took away from him is what makes him a man who needs help. Suppose that thing is there. You know it will be complete. But God, in order to create a space for you to have ministry into the life of your husband, he made him to be incomplete. He removed that thing so that he can be in need. He removed that thing and with it he made you. So when you now begin to discover some gaps, some gaps in his life, lapses, gaps, things that he is not able to do. I'm not talking about issues of sin. I'm talking about gaps in the lives of our husbands. There are gaps. There are things that you discover that your husband just doesn't know how to do this one. But you, you that's the thing you really know how to do. Have you discovered that before? Me, I have you know, many examples of that. It's just like that. There are things he just doesn't know how to do. But which me, I just know how to do very plenty. And so, that's the reason for my being there. So, when you now begin to see those 
those gaps in his life, those lapses, it is not a reason to criticize him. It is not a reason to say, ah, ah. I thought you are a man of God. You mean you don't know how to even do this one? So this is how you are. I wish I didn't marry a dirty man like you. You know some, some men are just very carefree. Eh? It's not a sinful issue. They are just carefree. They don't care about little, little, little things. Sometimes when they come back from work, they throw the tie in the parlor. They throw the shirt in the kitchen. And they go to the bedroom and put the shoes. <laughs> it's not a sin. But that's him. But you, you know that's how God matches people. I don't know how he does that thing. It's so wonderful. You will discover that the wife that such men marry, they are very neat. They are women who, who are very orderly. They just put things in order everywhere. Now, when you marry such a man, you don't begin to say, ah, ah, where are you like this now? Does being a man of God say we shouldn't be orderly? <laughs> you scatter shirts here. You put tie there. You put shoe on the television. <laughs> no. That lapse, that gap is not meant for criticism. That's actually the reason why you are there. So, contribute your own orderliness, your own cleanliness into his life and you will discover that everything will fit. Many times, what brings problems in our homes is this thing. These gaps, those are the things that bring problems. And you nag him and you complain and you talk against him and he says, ah, 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 but, but that's me. He just can't do any other thing. But you can do it. So why don't you contribute it? Because actually that cleanliness in you was in him before. But God took it out. <laughs> God took it out. And with it, he made you. And so contribute it back into his life and fit together. So by fitting together, you will be complete and he will be complete. Do you know, even with your own cleanliness, eh, that's all that you have. There are many other things that make for wholesomeness that you don't have that he has. So you too, you can't be complete until you fit in. All of us have need of one another. No need to complain, to nag, just because you see gaps in the lives of your husband. Fit in. That's the reason why you are there. Whatever is deficient in him is what is plenty in you. So contribute it back. Contribute it to him. It is as you contribute it into his life that you are complete and he is also complete. Sometimes the needs in the lives of our husbands are even spiritual. The needs may be spiritual. There could be some grace, some gifts of God that are not in him, but they are located in you. Don't use that to nag him. Contribute it to his life. Sometimes also the need in our husband's lives could be Sexual. Am I right? In our conjugal relationship. And some husbands are more demanding than others. But grace is located in you to meet the particular needs of your own husband. If your husband is demanding more than you think you can bear, eh? God is still very, very present. He's still working up till today to make you to fit into that need. 
He is still in the in the he's still working. He said, I will make. Is that not what he said? So if you discover that the need of your husband is is much more than what you think you are able to bear. Go to heaven again and say, God, you are my maker. You are the one who made this help for him. Now, his need is greater than my grace. Make me to fit into that need. Some of us, instead of praying, we cry too much. We talk too much. Ah, you are requesting too much. Is it because of this that I married you? I married you because of you. Ah, is it because... Ah, every day, every day, every day. <laughs> and so you complain. But you see, you are together. Eh? God has made you to be the one to meet that sexual need. Why can't you do that? Why can't you receive grace? And say, Lord, help me. Help me to fit into his life. Help me to adapt myself. We read in that, he said... I will make him a help adapted to him. Adapted to meet his needs. Do you know the grace of God in our lives makes us adaptable? Adaptable, not rigid. Some people are rigid wives. But God doesn't want us to be rigid. He, he wants us to be adaptable, flexible, stretchable to meet the particular needs of our husbands. Pray for grace rather than complain. The maker is still at work. Pray for grace. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that Mother Sarah, do you know Mother Sarah in the Bible? At the age of 90, was still able to sleep with her husband who was 100. Sometimes we have some taboos in our tradition that tell you, once you reach menopause, don't sleep with your husband again, no, you will have sickness. Am I right? There are some taboos, or oh, maybe you have not heard. There are some taboos like that. But that's not Christian. That's not Christian. You don't have to believe a tradition that is contrary to Bible. In the Bible, we have seen a woman who was still able to meet the sexual needs of her husband at the age of 90. And God did not think it wrong to come and visit them at 90, at that age, to say, yes, it is now the time for me to give you a child. And the child will not come until they have sexual relationship. That woman was adaptable. At age 90, she could still sleep with her husband. So let me say here that age is not a barrier. Grace is what is needed. Don't refuse him. Because that is what makes the traditional, the men who are traditional, to marry more wives. By the time their, husband, their wives reach menopause and she's refusing them, you will see a man who is 60 marrying a second wife. And you wonder, what is this man looking for? You better shut up. You don't know what his wife is doing to him in the secret. But for us, we don't have chance for that. Because we are not to be polygamous. So give him. There is nothing wrong. You won't be sick. That's not our own portion. Give him. Allow him. Have pleasure together. No matter the age. Until death do you part. That is Bible. You are the only help sweet table for him until death do you part. Receive grace to do it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Again, you will discover in that verse he said, and the Lord God said, I will make it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help, suitable for him. Now, we are, we are finished with the word suitable. We are now going to the word for. A help for him. 
Let me tell you that you are for him. You were made not for yourself. You were made not for your pastor primarily. You will help the pastor, you will work with him, you will work for him. But primarily, who were you created for? Is for your husband. Let's read another scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Take it from verse 8. Let's see. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Okay. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. All right. Now, that's to show an interdependence that God in his own wisdom made between the man and the woman. First he said, the man is not from the woman. Do you remember the creation story? Was the man made from the woman? It was rather the woman that was made from the man. Alright. Again, verse 9 says, Nor was the man created for the woman. Was the man created for the woman? Who was created for the other? The woman was created for the man. He said, I will make him a help suitable for him. So, my sister, you were created for your husband. You were made, tailor made, according to size, for him. You were not made for your mother. Some of us, when we get married, we still have our umbilical cord tied to our mother. And so we keep swinging back and forth. So you have not left them in order to cleave to this man. That will not work well. You were not created for your mother. You were not created for your father. You were created for who? For your husband. And as I've been speaking, widows, you were also created for God. You were made for him. So that means everything in you, eh? everything within you, my sister, Yes, please come. The one in glasses. Will you please come? Yes. You were made for your husband. Though. You are married, I'm sure. Okay. Now, look at this, my sister. Please, can climb up a bit. Have you seen her? Did you see how beautiful she is? Eh? With all her beauty, everything like this, whom was she made for? For her husband. This beauty is for that man. It's not for beauty contests. 